Thank you very much. This is the worst possible time of the year for me to give a talk. Uh, probably the best from your point of view, um, but it's the worst possible time because you sort of get into the diving again and you do longer and longer decompressions and you start looking up things about the wrecks again and you remember the facts and figures that you need and uh, that are interesting. So uh, so just a quick introduction, I'm not going to dwell long. This is really, um, this, this whole talk is really a gloss through some of the wrecks. It's nothing in depth. You could pick two of these wrecks, and we have done this, myself and my buddy who I dive with and organizes a lot of my diving, Barry McGill um, from Donegal. And we, we literally pick two wrecks, and we can do a whole hour's presentation easily on two wrecks or even one wreck if you want. That's that's how much you sort of we get involved in the wrecks. I, I'm an instructor, but I only down to about 50 meters. Um, I also have been diving about 35 years. I have on closed circuit, in other words, rebreathers, where you breathe the same breath round and round uh, since 2003, so almost 20 years. I'm a mechanical engineer, as he says, and I'm also, uh, I have the very lowest level of commercial diving, um, which is useful for media. So I've got involved in quite a few over the last sort of 15 years or so, quite a few TV type documentaries and things like that. So on the right hand side, I'm not expecting you to read all that, but on the right hand side, we have found, uh, uh, so this is unashamedly, uh, uh, it's not a Donegal only talk, but it's unashamedly, uh, that's where we do 90% uh, of our diving. We do dive the Lusitania. I've done 15 dives in Lusitania. It's not, it's not incredible diving, whereas the diving in Donegal is pretty incredible because you've got the best visibility in Ireland watching, watching Donegal. You don't have that in the IRC, you only have to go out there and have a look even on an incoming tide and see the color of the water, yeah, on the Irish Sea, so, typically. So we, we found a lot of wrecks. I found them with other people, uh, other group like Dark Star, the first one there, it's an English group. It's the only group that sort of, sort of rivals what we do in Ireland. So Ireland, for its size and the number of divers, there, there are very few people doing what, what the Brits call gas diving, which means you're using trimix in your mix to reduce the amount of nitrogen. So this isn't a, this isn't a talk on your percentage of gases or anything like that, or you know, where you're going by every breather, quite the opposite, actually. It's a pretty picture talk, more so. So we have been involved in finding, and heavily we found a lot of the bigger vessels over, you know, up to sort of 10 years ago, the HMSs, uh, in other words, the Royal Navy and the RMSs, which are the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company. So we they're, they're the prestige ships that were really well mm -hmm. built. And a lot of them are um from the first world war. So 63 meters is the shallowest dive we do on Audacious, which is the battleship of Donegal, and 163 is the deepest. We've only done that once. We've done a lot of 140s, 150. Um, so we only do one dive a day, which sounds pretty weak, really, but that's really all you can fit in in the day. One of the big problems uh, is time, as you'll see down here at the very, very bottom of the slide, cost and time, and just basically fitting in not just your dive, but it's the journey out, maybe four or five six hours in the water and then your journey home and just trying to get somewhere to get food that's still open to try and do your gases and your scrubbers and things for your carbon dioxide so the difficulty is fit, it's not fitting the diving into the day it's fitting life into the day and some sleep as well because a few days a few days go by together if you haven't been sleeping properly you know if you've only five hours it's during the night to sleep and you've broken sleep or you're not hydrating or whatever so hydration is really important in deep diving. Um, so we have gone as far as 75 miles offshore. At that point, VHF is no use. We we rent a sap phone to go offshore when we're really far out. Um, so, so there's a lot of challenges, as I, as I mentioned there, even down to things like seasickness because you're on a boat for large parts of the day. Sometimes when you're seasick, you're better off getting into the water and just hang around at six meters or something than stay on the surface. So clearly, staying on the surface is the worst possible option on a boat that's rolling. Um, th there are things called classics up in Donegal, they're really sort of a diverse term, um, and that would be Audacious, the battleship, which we will talk about very soon, the Empire Heritage, I don't know if you've ever heard, there are Sherman tanks lying in the seabed up there, American tanks, quite a few of them, and Justicia, which is 70 metres, so that's the deepest part of um, our classics. That's a barbette there of, um, on, on Audacious, that background picture. And that's a diver who was at the time relatively new to deep diving, a very good diver at the same time. The Empire Heritage, the Sherman Tanks, and then in a second, this is this is the picture that sort of got a lot of us into deeper diving. 
And this was done by a guy called Lee Bishop, a British diver, who came across quite a few times going back 20 and a bit years ago. And he, he pictured, he took this picture using film. So this is well pre-digital. And you can see the fish on the right-hand side are all moving there. Even the diver's legs are all blurry because the, the, the exposure was probably something like 20 seconds or something like that. And he would have been pushing the film. Do you ever hear of this pushing? All you guys are all about pushing film. So it might've been ISO 1600, he would have been pushing it to double that to try and get the exposure and then telling the processor what, he was, what, what the problems were with the way he took the picture. But you can see how upright she is. The anchor's way off the seabed. You'll still see this plate here. You'll see pictures now in a second. There's quite a few holes in the front. Quite a few railings, hard to see, are still there. But you'll see the deterioration. They deliberately put a deterioration shot in this. I'm not expecting it to read any of this, by the way. It's not your eyesight. It's not, it's not your eyesight. So this just shows you, and it's just to remind me to talk about the northern approaches. So that's where all the shipping came from, America and Canada. So Britain would only last a matter of something like three weeks unless it got support in, in actually both wars, I would say. The difficulty they had is they needed, they needed food, fuel, materials, and they needed tanks, and you'll see them on the seabed from World War II. So they needed a lot of things. They either came in underneath Ireland to get to Britain, or they came in over. Mostly they came in over Ireland, the north because it was closer coming from Canada following a great circle line. So we were divers, so we're quite simple. So we have to simplify it down to this. This is what the skipper simplifies because we can't we can't understand all that writing. Um it's it's you probably can't make out individual X there, but uh, some of our X up here, this is the Curacao, it's she's cut in two by the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary is still alive, as you I don't know if it's a hotel and you can go and visit on board and I don't know if you can see the bridge, but it's beautiful. Because uh, we've we've done some filming of this in Deep Wreck Mysteries, um, which you will find on YouTube. Deep Wreck Mysteries, I I recommend it. The beauty about the Curacao was she was a World War One um, ship about four thousand tons. Um, she ended up being in World War Two. The difficulty was her engines and her everything was very tired, and the boilers were very tired. And she was trying to give air cover. She had to convert to air cover for the Queen Mary. And the difficulty with that was she couldn't go as fast as Queen Mary. Queen Mary was over 80,000 tons, a massive ship. Um, and as I said, unlike something like the Olympic or whatever, which was scrapped later, the, the Queen Mary survived. So these are just some, not all. The ones we're going to talk about top left is, is the Vicnor. It uh, became HMS. The difficulty with the British, the Royal Navy, calling something a HMS is, it was sure to sink within three months. <laughs> dreadful. There's a huge loss of life too, which is dreadful. Down the bottom right is a very modern submarine, the whitish looking one, very modern. That particular captain decided to paint his one white because he felt he was less likely to be you know, caught um, either on the surface or under the surface. That's a, that, that is the birth of the modern submarine over there in the right hand picture. Left hand of Hearst Castle, which Barry found with the skipper, and I'll talk more about that. And uh, Lusitania, we all know about Lusitania. Uh, it's not the best diving. So people are sparse to Lusitania and they tick the box in their logbook or whatever, and then they very promptly often don't want to go back to the Lusitania, which is sort of sad, but that's the type of wreck it is. So just starting off with Audacious, a uh, super dreadnought battleship. So you can see all these guns, these uh, super firing 13 and a half inch guns. She had 10 of them. So it's significant weight and size wreck. It was over 23,000 tons. And she had 16 smaller four-inch guns. So she was around the side. So she was very, very well armed. And she eventually um, foundered on, on a minefield. That's, that's a pretty, uh, what they call multi-beam image. Uh, so it's taking echo soundings, if you like, just lots of them. And they build up a picture. And then they add in this color thing to give the various heights. It's sort of a... It's a false image of the wreck, but it does give you an idea. And you can see the barbette. This is where the guy was on the early black and white picture, where the guy was sort of hanging around in the middle of it. Pretty picture. This is where the guns are here on the bottom, bottom right. And the rudders are at the back and the props and everything at the back. She was unsalvaged. So Risdon Beasley, has anyone heard of Risdon Beasley? He was a great man for getting permission from, the, from London uh, to go and salvage wreck and he would keep, I can't go with the numbers, where he'd keep 80% and he'd give them the balance or whatever. Um, so he was good at pulling non-ferrous metals out of wrecks. He never found this when he wanted to. And clearly there's going to be a lot of 
copper pipes and condensers and props and things, but they're, they're still there, luckily, for us to have a look at. And this, this, this is, is a competition. This is in Kiel, you won't be able to read that, but this is in Kiel in July the 20th, 1914. So this is literally a few weeks, I think it's less than four weeks before the war started. They were having competitions for gunnery with Germany, and they were having competitions uh, boat racing, small boat racing between the cooks and the chefs on the boats. So a month before the war, this was a visit from a British Royal Navy over in Kiel. So it's it's quite incredible how quickly the First World War started. On the bottom right, these are the guns. This is a picture by Baron Gill, I think, because I think that's me in it, so clearly I'm not taking a picture. No, not that you can't do that nowadays. <laughs> Lots of Barry's pictures have him in various places all around the place. And quite incredible what you can do. Um, if you ever see a picture and you're not sure what people are up to, look along a straight edge. Look along that straight edge there. If you see any kinks in it, that's not because the Royal Navy can't make a 13 and a half inch gun. It's because people have been stitching together various photographs and trying to get lots of light in various corners of the photograph. The big trick is these guns are 15 meters long. And in any water around Ireland, no matter how much I boast about it, go, any water around Ireland, it's hard to take a picture from over 15 meters and still get lots of light over there. It was difficult. You certainly won't be able to throw light yourself. So what people, what Barry has done is he's doing photogrammetry now, 3D, but what he does with a lot of these pictures is he, he goes along and he, he, he sets it to take a picture every few seconds and he goes along out, out of the frame of the picture and he shines light on it. He literally paints the light on it and he goes along. Yeah. So I could do that in this room, plenty of light in this end of the room. I could take a picture every few seconds. I could walk down the room with a torch and I could light all your faces up or something like that. And then I would stitch all the pictures, literally called, it's called stitching all the pictures together. But you can generally tell if somebody has stitched the picture if you look closely enough. Um, so what is this? This is difficult to see, but on the bottom right is, is the top of our Malin head would be right over to the right-hand side there. And this is a, the SS Berlin, which was a German liner converted to drop mines out the back. And this German liner in, in World War I was told to lay this in the Furter Fort over in Scotland. And heard so much radio traffic on whatever they, what do they use in World War I meeting, where was it? I don't know. Because, I, because I'm so young, so I don't know. And um, so they heard so much traffic that they, that they decided to lay the mines here. The captain was told, given a desk job. He was told he didn't do a good job. In fact, he did an amazing job. He laid all his mines in that hatched area there, and he caught the audacious on gunnery trials, and he caught the in the Vicknow, which we will talk about. So this is this is the, the back of the audacious. That's the rudder on the left. These are the props. It's hard to see in that picture. Some of these um, the brightness isn't is amazing, but that that propeller there is about three meters off the bottom. Nowadays, it's digging itself into the bottom. The more recent picture on the bottom right. So all these wrecks are deteriorating. The the keel here. The bottom of the keel, it's slumped over towards us as we see it. So the, the, the sides of the record um, disintegrating. And it's the inner hull, the watery tight hull. The actual um, armor plate is, is over 12 inches thick in this wreck. So it's still dug into, the, dug into the gravel there and it's still standing upright. But the wreck inside it is, is falling apart. There's a lot of deterioration. This is the back end looking from a different angle to the torpedo tube at the back. This big hole wasn't there when I started diving. You can swim through here and come out by one of the propellers that's dug into it. So it's all changing. Eventually, it won't be long. It's only a matter of a couple of... In, in Ireland and Donegal, you get these surges, the huge surges that come through. And it happens sometimes even in the summer. And you just have to hold on to something. It's like a surge and it'll drag you backwards and forwards um, for about a minute. So something happens way out at sea and it's like a pressure wave that hits you. And it won't be long until those propellers are lying on the seabed um, horizontally. They're sticking up nicely. The wreck is upside down, obviously, if the rivers are sticking up. I failed to mention the wreck is upside down. <laughs> so I'm just going to talk about another wreck here. And the Atrato it was originally built uh, for cruising. She became the Viking. And then the British requisitioned it. It was never designed for war. Very light bulkheads and all the rest. Never designed for war. It didn't take much to sink her. She, uh, the British already had a HMS Viking, so they called it the HMS Vicknor, is the name they gave it. And it's an 86 meters. I, I happened to be with the British group up in Donegal, and I just happened to be on, on the first dive with them. She was very, no, very, she's the only wreck up there with a the clipper bow, 
um, a sort of a bit of a counter stern, but the clipper bow, very distinctive. And that's how we sometimes, we've never found anything with Vignor written on it on the, on the wreck. And that's sometimes how we identify wrecks, that they have a very unique feature. If they're the only wreck that ever sunk up there with that feature. The other thing is the number of boilers, is the number of boilers is a dead giveaway. Now you can't have two ship wrecks, obviously, with the same number of boilers, but if they've got all the other things that fit in place. So you can see this, you can see the curve here of the um, of the clipper. And the anchor's still in place, even though the hose pipes are all falling through there now. <coughs> This is in about 86 meters, so it's it's deep enough. Um, but at this sort of depth, we'd we'd probably be doing about 30, 40 minutes easily at this depth, and maybe three hours, two and a half, three hours of decompression. Decompression is just coming up very, very slowly and stopping at various stops. But, uh, these are guns, there's guns all around lying, it's two calibers, but that's the main one, lying all around the place. I can date these pictures by some of the gear we're wearing, some of the cameras that the uh, the lights and all the rest you can sort of we can sort of date them and these are the engine the engines are literally they're starting to fall a bit now the engines are like a skyscraper on this vessel big old um, triple expansion steam engines and you can see a pic oh, sorry you can see a picture here I'm just going to go back you can see a picture here of, of the original company made the steam engines and there's a sort of a, a motor or a DC generator or something I think there in the front but they are absolutely massive. And there's this Lophelia. Has anyone ever heard of Lophelia? Or does it? No. This deep water coral that you hear in the in the news. And anytime you hear about it, the only you'll only find is in 200 plus meters and maybe a thousand meters and all this sort of stuff off the southwest coast of Ireland. But we're we're finding it in 86. I don't think we've seen it shallower than that. We usually find it in wrecks in about 130 meters or whatever. But it, it never it never grows near the bottom. That's on a big flag wheel there. It always is about three, four meters above the bottom. So it's obviously too silty or something near the bottom for it to survive. It's, it's a hard coral, you can snap it off. So this is my favorite picture that I've ever taken. And it was easy to take. The first year I took up a, a digital SLR and put it in the housing. And this, this the, the July was okay, but the August, the visibility was stunning on this wreck. You could almost see from one end to the other. It was absolutely crystal. It was like a swimming pool. Um, and you can see the, the propeller, this is the rudder here, and then the, looking up at the bottom of the wreck, obviously lying over on the port side. And it, it, it's so clear that we've actually been looking at, you know, these gudgeons and pintles, you guys know what gudgeons and pintles do? I see it out, I see it out. But it's actually different than the justicia, and we're sort of comparing these notes and learning ourselves, because we're not, we're not ship boats by any means, we're, we're learning by sort of stumbling along. So, this, is a, this was a ship surgeon, and uh, we've actually been in touch with his great grand nephew. And he's written, a, he's done quite, it's, it's a book, but he hasn't, he hasn't published it. And it's really, really interesting. He's found out everything there is to be found out. And he contacts us every now and again. Have you dived it again? You know, what's going on? So you do learn a lot about history. Three, there was the official figure of 295, I think, died on this. Um, nobody made it out alive because she just wasn't any hole anywhere and she just wasn't suitable um, for, for holding water out. And um, in fact, the official figure, this guy, the grand, great grand nephew of this guy, um, he's, he's found out there's actually 300 people on board. He's actually done all the names and everything. It's quite a lot of research. Another wreck, and this is World War II, um, and it took a long time. The skipper was going out every October. It took him about five or six years to find this. I was I wasn't there that day. I think there was a we brought some up. Um, and he would burn diesel every he'd go out for a day, he'd go out, you know, at three or four in the morning, he'd be back at three or four in the morning, and he'd do nothing but motor around looking for vessels like this, very hard to find. Uh, this was a a castle class Corvette, World War II, built for World, in World War, in World War II, actually, not built before World War II. But there were only a thousand, a thousand and ten tons this. So they're extremely lightly built. So if you touched off it with anything, you know, she was gonna she was gonna fold or have a hole in it. If she touched anything or anything around it, it just wasn't gonna survive. And the beauty about this thing and what makes it super distinctive, it's got a huge fair lead at the front, it's got a one forward one, and it's got this thing up here, which you'd see a close-up of, and it's got a bell there. It's got a black bell that you've never seen. It'd be lovely to see the bell and see the name on it because obviously being a Royal Navy would have the name stamped on the bell. 
But the beauty about this is it, and it was this type of vessel, I think it was 33 of them made, if I remember. And these these actually won the Battle of the Atlantic, these small vessels, relatively small vessels. And this is a picture just of the initial finding showing the bow that Barry did, the, where the gun placement is, and the um, the squid launchers. Squids are just big mortars. And um, there's the fairly that uh, I call it a fairly. Do you call it something else? Well, you should be ship people there. I don't know. They must have reckoned they were going to be towed. But one of the big problems with underwater photography is if you were there without any, and you just had a small torch, not only would most of it be very, very dark, but under here would be pitch black. Absolutely, incredibly black. And the trick with underwater photography is to try and get light where there is no light. Um, and we use video lights, wide angle video lights when we're taking pictures. And sometimes it works out. So this is a squid launcher, three pipes that are offset. You see the bottom picture, they're slightly offset. There's actually a lobster living in this one. But the squids are actually in there because we know because they're so full. But basically they loaded the squids in and this thing relied on ASDIC, which is we know it as Echo Sandy today. So they basically were, it, 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 in the past when they wanted to kill a submarine, they threw things out the back, didn't they? The things were firing up in the air and then there was a boom and you see the big splash. Yeah? This was quite the opposite. This fired over her own bows. So this increased the kill rate from sort of three, four percent up to three, four, five percent up to almost 50 percent. So this was this was the dog chasing the hare. If the hare turned, the dog turned. Yeah. So and it was automatic, it automatically fired. So when the Aztec, which was pretty impressive, so it was it was gimbaled as well. The ship was rolling, she was on a motor, she was gimbaled to because it. So the gimbal didn't know when it was going to fire. The people on the boat didn't know when it was going to fire. They just made it active. And the echo sound that was reflecting off it had to be a certain distance away at a certain depth, and then it knew to fire. And the kill rate of the submarines, the, U, the German U-boats, went up dramatically. So finding this sitting upright on a plate is incredible. It, like you'd expect to see these things half buried and upside down and you know just not pretty, but this is uh, exceptional. And there's lots of these foreign shells lying around the place, uh, piles them. And the squids themselves, I'm not sure, I don't have a, I don't have a picture of the squid. It just like, looks like a fat, it looks like a torpedo actually, a fat mortar. And if, you, if you're steady in these, in these pictures, if you can get a model that will stay in the same place, shine as stuff. The trick with the models on the water is that torches are so bright nowadays, the LED torches. If he just shines it on the object that you want to shine on, you'll just have a big white blob. A white out, yeah. You have to get them to shine it behind it, and then I, as a photographer, would fill the light whatever I think I need to expose that. So it's very important that you and your model, if you have a model, if you're lucky that somebody will spend time with you and waste their time on the dive just for you to get a picture. You're lucky if they, if he's shown that, uh, I've done this again, if he's shown that in front of these shells, it'd just be a big white out. You wouldn't see them at all. And if you wait long enough to get it right, all the um, big. You probably know them as pouting or bib, do These fish, they, the wreck fish, some people call them, they start coming in around back to where they were because you frighten them off by arriving there. So she's in bits. We haven't, we found the back half last year and we found the bell on the back half. It was about 300 meters away. And we've, the bell is now with the receiver of wreck. So, so, um, so that's all, all being looked after. That's been held for a year until we can get back. And we're going to give it to the, the Castle of Past Association. The, the, the guy who, the U-boat who shot that, he was, he was a count, believe it or not. And he was pretty vicious. He came up between, he came up between two Castle of Past Corvettes, the Provenci and the Hearst Castle, and shot one, disappeared down. We think he went under and hid on the north side of Ratton Island. The, the British never caught on that the subs went shallow. They always assumed the subs went like northwest and found deep water and in big open spaces. The Germans were, were very, very clever. They used to go into about 20 meters. So this would never be that good that you would look down. They used to hide in 20 meters so that the British would never bring their corvette in, in that close and look for them. Yeah. So there was a lot. They often, the Germans were quite good at hitting a vessel and then going underneath it. It's not something you'd expect them to do because it's now breaking up and maybe sinking. So this is a keep doing this. Don't I? This is a a two five one one, the absolute birth of the modern submarine. There's, there's almost no difference between this and a modern, if there was such a thing now, diesel submarine. I think they're all pretty much nuclear now. 
Um, and it had three times the number of batteries as your type 7C years, fog bog standard that they made most of. And, and they all started with U25 and then another three numbers. Um, and she's lying on her, on her, uh, get this right, on her port side, and she's she's very impressive. There was a big sunfish the last time we dived this. Big sunfish surfing around two or three times. Only one person managed to get the camera switch on and get a picture of it, and it just swam off. So we were clearly, this was where he hangs out and feeds or whatever. So clearly. So there is there is quite big um uh, fauna up up in that, that direction. So it, this is the bow area. There were six torpedo tubes instead of the usual four. And again, she had torpedo tubes obviously at the stern as well. And it's, it's very impressive. A lot of the torpedo tubes have fallen to the seabed, but that's looking back towards the stern. Very impressive wreck. They were made, the hulls were made for pressure. They were made with a double eight. So they couldn't make just one big cylinder because the pressure, they were able to go uh, three times deeper. They were able to go to 150 meters. They often went well over 200 meters, well over 200, 230, 40 during the war to escape um, depth charges. So very impressive, massive number of batteries. So the only thing that, that, that they could stay in the water, modern submarines stay in the water for a minimum of three to four months, like minimum three months when they go to sea. Once they submerge, once they go out of their pens, you know, they don't come up for any reason, for almost no reason. So the, the only two things that modern submarines have a problem with is food and fuel. Nuclear reactor, you don't have a fuel issue. And very much in line with this World War II vessel, food and fuel. Yeah, because they could they could run along. We we'll get to it here. On the bottom right there, you'll see this thing, which was a snorkel, which was very, very modern design of snorkel. So they could motor with only just that sticking up, and it was covered with a rubber coating. You can see a sort of zigzag on it, a radar reflective coating with different size holes to absorb the radar so it wouldn't bounce back. And it was built on the other JCB had these shiny rams on them. It was built with two of those, it used to come from the bottom of the vessel, up out of the vessel and stick up straight. It wasn't a fold up, fold down type standard World War II snorkel. These are light, these are uh, sealed uh, containers along the deck, and this one has a life raft in it. I think that's it's yellow, it was all brittle. I think it's since washed out of that just with the normal aging process. But that's what he's taking a picture. That's Barry taking a picture. Very photogenic wreck. You can see the, the rudder, the the um, hydroplanes, the propellers, the other propellers obviously down below. So very, very um, very beautiful wreck. She used to have this. We went back to the sister. There's a sister. There's two of them up in Donegal. 2506 is the other one. And it has this beautiful streamlining that you don't really see this sort of streamlining on vessels. And it sort of discovered streamlining in, in the uh, Second World War in a big way. And we, we had seen it and had a camera on, on the other wreck, sister of this. These, something I didn't say and I should have, these wrecks were dumped at the end of the Second World War. So up in Donegal, you have 116 wrecks that were dumped called in Operation Deadlight. You just Google Operation Deadlight that the Royal Navy, they had, they had from November 45 uh, till the end of February 46. And they sort of left them along finger till the end of February 46, but it was really, really stormy conditions. And these things, submarines do not tow very well, apparently, behind the ship. And they ended up, they were supposed to dump them all in the agreement. With um, with all the allies, they agreed they dumped them in excess of 100 meters, and only 50 percent are actually in 100, over 100 meters. So they they didn't really achieve their goal fully. And um, you can see the propeller there. The streamlining, which would have been here covering the shaft, the prop shaft, is is gone. And we went back to the other one, which we had seen, and it was gone too. So just thin place right away. Those are the breaks. This is not that vessel. This is actually a World War One vessel. We we have found U eighty nine. We have found um, Nick Hanrahan found U eighty nine. This one, and that's looking through a hatch on it. Um, which I'm going to talk about now in a second. We found two others. The second of which was the one that finished off just issue. It's a huge liner, the third biggest liner sunk ever, merchant vessel sunk, and. Uh, the the only one we haven't found is the one that's on the Amazon, which we think is up in about 150 and 60 meters up beside the Amazon, which was a 
a line or a row and then steam pipe it. So the only reason I put this one up is you can see the head here, which is the toilet. You can see a, a drain or breathing system here, the mouthpiece is here, and this is the canister that you breathe in and out of to scrub the CO2. So it's like an escape apparatus, and this is World War I now. And you can see two torpedoes with counter-rotating props to just make sure the torpedo went in a straight line. Yeah. So um, and they're all full of they're all still full of explosives and everything. They're all just lying there. You can go and give them a hug if you want. So there's lots of them and these vessels. There's lots of and lots of them um, on uh, audacious, which you spoke about, lots of cordite and explosive stuff. There's lots of stuff in these wrecks. So nobody has gone up there and cleaned the place up. Nobody, nobody's ever typically able to work at those depths, you know. Be a huge amount of money spent on things like that. So Justicia, I said, I think if I'm right, is the third biggest after Britannic and Lusitania. She's about 32,000 tons, 226 meters long. So she's huge. She's in Dazzle there. This was done by a historian, which, which we now invite on a lot of our trips uh, from Hungary. And I just get on very well with him and take pictures of whatever he wants to take pictures. He works out how a vessel exploded, depending on which way the plates are pointing and all the rest. He's, he's, he's very, very... He, he literally hand draws Rex from what you told him and you show him a couple of pictures and he'll draw what's on the bottom exactly as you saw. Um, this is in Dazzle. I'm sure you've all heard of Dazzle. I think the idea was, wasn't to hide the vessel, it was just make it very difficult for them to identify what they were looking at and the length and all the rest. Um, big, big vessel. And that's her now lying in a seabed. World War I, so she's down there over 100 years. There was no, there's not a lot left. The boilers are sticking up. The, the bow is actually starting to disintegrate. That's the fireman's tunnel that's going back behind the bridge. So there was a tunnel all the way along the bottom of the vessel under all the cargo holes. And that was so the, the people who shovel the coal and wheelbarrow the coal could walk from one end of the vessel back to the quarters or whatever. Um, and that's the bow. That's the number I showed you a picture right at the beginning with the fish all blurred. So that's the bow. There is, there is an anchor on the port side. This anchor is now near the seabed. This side, the starboard side's all falling out. Some of the handrails still, the guy at the top there, is still in place. But it is, it is deteriorating. You can, see, you can see it hanging out there. So that, that's all going to, I mean, the anchor's almost touching the seabed. It's all, it's all deteriorating. I suppose. If you're that long at the bottom of the ocean, in all the storms in the winter. And that's the bow looking from the top. The, the most impressive thing about the bow is all the capstans, even from when I started diving it, they're all sticking up. That's because the deck has actually collapsed down, and all the capstans, which would have been at deck level, they're all high, they're all high and dry, they're all two, three meters above the deck. In fact, this area has collapsed in there. And that's an anchor derrick at the front there, it's starting to fall in. So Lusitania, everyone wants to know about the Lusitania. This is my partner, Yvonne, who's dived it, I think, five times, maybe. And this is the, the stem here. And the big joke was she was looking at two nudibranch. Does anyone know what a nudibranch is, other than the divers? Yeah. It's a slug without a shell. So, so you know, I'm not. They're beautifully colored and little things in the backs and the beautiful, beautiful colors now. But, uh, but the same people who go around taking macro pictures of all these slugs don't go out into their, their garden at night and start looking under, under bricks and things in their walls looking for snails and slugs and things. So it's quite funny. So she saw this, these couple of slugs and she was looking up and under. Meanwhile, that picture is blurry because I'm actually fitting towards her to tell her we're way over time. The shot was way back behind the bridge. We had a long way to fit back against the current. And she's just obliviously looking at the slugs on the bow, yeah? <laughs> which, which, uh, which is great. So this is it, it's this thing is in ninety three meters. The seabed is ninety three meters. This is coming towards where we were there a second ago, and the two chains have slipped down the decks, and the two chains are now lying against the starboard side, just sort of at the edge, right at the cusp of the edge of the starboard side. And a lot of the deck planking is still there on the bow. It's quite, quite impressive, the, the wood. Very hard to take a picture. You can see the visibility. Uh, yeah, you can see the visibility there too. So, so this is a tr one of the first times, uh, actually, this is the first dive I ever did on the Lusitania in 2008. 
And we were deliberately looking for bullets on this trip, but not necessarily on the first dive. And we had an ROV down. So that picture was, is a still from a video which was taken by an ROV. And ROVs are coffee table size ROVs. The light is here, the camera's here. The one thing you don't do underwater, it's a bit like putting your full headlights on in the fog. You're, you're shining your light from your car into the fog. It's going to, all the droplets going to bounce the light back. You'd always use your dick lights in fog. And it's a bit like that. But I was involved in, it, these bullets had been found two years earlier by a couple of divers in Wexford. Um, Harry Hannon and Victor Quirk. But they didn't know where they were on the wreck. They had to finish their dive there, couldn't get back to the shot, couldn't find the shot, and they came straight up. The difficulty is they had no reference relative to the shot. They'd have to fin 10 meters, they'd have to fin 20 meters. They had no reference. And this is going through the hull at the side of the vessel. So we're not on the deck, actually, we're on the side of the vessel. The side of the vessel has sort of fallen and kinked in places. And the ROV got jammed in two places. I went down and freed it, had ropes in the prop and all the rest. I went down and freed it. And I just went another few meters, looked in the hole, and the human eye is far better than a camera. And then a camera sees further in bad visibility, but a human eye can pick out, you know, the the um the green color, the pattern, I suppose, of of, bra of, of brass that's corroded. And I found a bullet, and we were allowed to bring up eight under license, so that's that's all we did. A big deal at times. Um, hard to know why it was a big deal, but anyway, it was a big deal at time. We had to put it in Tupperware, then we had to hand over customs as soon as you go back to shore. And they and we were told they'd know what to do to preserve it. And they took it in their hand, they opened it, and went, Oh, is that what they are? What do we do with it? <laughs> so maybe maybe they weren't experts at preserving, but they're just three or three Remingtons made in the made in the States for the war. So she was carrying about five million of these. So I don't think you need five million bullets to uh, defend a ship. I think once you've shot your first thousand, if you haven't defended by then, you're, you've uh, you've lost the battle. Yeah. So there's about there were, these were intended for the for the front line. The the Brits would hide behind the fact that you don't have to declare bullets because bullets don't form a chain reaction. You know, if you shoot or put a torpedo or you shoot a bullet into those bullets, it doesn't knock the next one off, next one, next one, next one. It doesn't do that. You just hit a bullet. Yeah. So, so they were hiding behind that you don't have to declare it. So it's not it's not really munitions, but in fact, they're fully live shells, totally live, unused, ready to go. And uh, so, so there is your question: Should should the loose chain have been stuck by the Germans? The Germans gave lots of warnings, by the way, because they knew what was going on between the So there makes you think of. Why was there a second explosion when there was only ever one torpedo fired? So I'm actually diving at this uh, with some Belgian guys, and that historian I mentioned earlier. <laughs> and the theory is they can get into the boiler room now to see if it was a boiler explosion. But uh, there has been, I was in there last year. This guy over near the, near the window over there, he was there last year. And they couldn't, no evidence of boiler blown up, I don't think. And there won't be this year. So I can predict the future. I'm good at that. There you go. So I've had several expeditions, and this was this was the best of all. This is with the bullets again. I, I've been in men's vogue, which they promptly then stopped making for some reason, just because I was in. And um, this is the U-boat on the bottom right. This is the U-boat washed up in Denmark. The U-boat that uh, had killed U-20, that had killed Lusitania. And I was involved in some very nice National Geographic and Discovery Channel and stuff, and it's very very sexy. And this is this is Phil Newton. Which no of you will know, but he made this new suit in the bottom middle there. So the new suit is an incre incredible thing and patented. You jump into it, you go down to whatever depth you want. You come back, it it's actually opens at the waist. They crack it open on a sort of a hydraulic system. It cracks open and you step out. So you can spend hours, as long as you can last down there before you have your sandwiches taped to the side of the, chew your sandwiches off the side of the, the inside of the helmet. Yeah? <laughs> and you can go down there or your gum or whatever. You can go down there as long as you can survive in this thing at one atmosphere, this pressure. You can sit in that thing, enjoy yourself down there at pretty much huge depths. And just came out and stepped out, no decompression, you don't get wet. You probably get sweaty if you don't get wet. So it's quite incredible. Uh, so this is this was me meeting one of my heroes. You know, it's very rare you meet your hero. And they say don't, <laughs> you'll be disappointed because he was an incredible man stuff. I monopolized him. He was on the boat now. He was on the, we were on the Grony Way for nine days. I monopolized it. They were, the production company rented the Grony Way with Irish light shit. So, this is the owner, um, Greg Beams. He, he died uh, about two years ago. 
and he was delighted to get a bullet on another trip. Delighted with himself. We brought up some brass and license a couple of weeks after that, that trip you saw there. We uh, brought up some stuff for the museum, and they're trying to get money now to develop a, a really fancy museum on the old head. It's now, you probably know the Lusitania is now owned by a group of, you know, uh, what's the charity, but a group of 12 guys are directors in the old head museum itself. Um, telemotor, the thing that sort of did the power steering, they like from the steering wheel in the back of the pickup there. <laughs> and telegraph, that was found much more recently, um, just before COVID. This, was, this had gone to the surface and I'd gone back down because of a faulty lift bag uh, from another group and it was went all the way up to the doll chamber. It was discussed in the doll that some artifact in this chain is so important it could have gone back to see that. And by chance, uh, Barry and our group saw something yellow off to one side. And of course, the divers, have a, divers have an incredible suspicion that we were deliberately going to look for that. Whereas apparently we weren't, like we don't go off onto the sand when we're looking at the wreck. It just happened to be seen up there. We secured it on dive to, to the wreck because it, it was what they call in peril. It could have been dragged away by an F because it was way off the wreck. Uh, it was off the wreck, but eight, 10 meters. And, and then the third dive, we had permission to, to lift it. Big deal. There's a lot of stuff going on with the loose tenure. Yeah. We dive wrecks in Donegal, we don't tell anyone, we just go and dive them. We, get, we do that, if it's over 100 years old, we get permission to go and dive them. There's no, there's no fuss, there's no permissions from the underwater archaeology unit, which there is. You need a license from the people who own it, the museum, you need a license from the underwater archaeology unit. You, you don't need it for a lot of other things. So this is a student decompression. We put in bars at six metres and nine metres. And that's Yvonne, she's my partner. She was the first Irish woman to dive the list tenure, which is great. Not the first woman, she's about the fifth, maybe the sixth, not sure. We do have the names of the people who've died, just female names. Um, obviously the flag, uh, White Star. So the, the, there, was, there was a band that was very intact. It had the shower arrangement, it had a rose at the top, and it had jets then coming all around it. I don't know if you've ever seen any of the really old houses. You see them in, even in Dublin, the really old houses. And this we reckon was in the first class bath. And when this picture was taken, it was still connected. There's the rose on the top. It was still connected to the bath down below, which is just at the, anything sort of three meters away on the list is at the limit of viz, visibility. The divers call it viz. And now they're separated. So it's, the, the, it's been dragged off. Because the guys are fishing it. There's an exclusion zone around the loose tank about, I think it's about two miles by six miles, so 12 square miles, but everyone ignore it, ignores it because clearly there's a huge amount of fish on the loose tank. Yeah? So they, they still fish and then the nest get go across the wreck and, and they, they drag things off. So I'm going to show you a quick bit of video. Um, that Barry made, I wasn't on the particular trip actually. It's about three minutes long. So at the end of it, you'll see those steam chimes or steam whistles. That's the only reason I threw up that steam whistle there. So these things you see, that's a, a handset, a controller for a rebreather. These are all rebreathers, all these things here. Actually, a lot of people since this was taken, and um, 10 years ago, a lot of people have moved on to a, a newer type of rebreather. And even side mount rebreathers where you carry you have a whole new rebreather that's sort of like, it looks like a big cylinder on your side. So some of us have gone and got trained. There's the rebreathers there. So any of this diving, it's all closed circuit rebreathers. It's not open circuits. Nobody going beyond 70 meters. Even 70, they're not going to on, on open circuits, which is your bubble. Mm -hmm. the bubble so. so you see there's no bubbles coming out of the guy at all. There shouldn't be. On the way up, there'll be some bubbles because obviously expansion, he has to vent some. But on the way down, there should be, if there are bubbles coming out, you've got a problem. These are made, these particular rebreathers were made in the UK and in Cornwall. So you can see the visibility, yeah? Three and a half meters would be a really good day on the south coast. So, does it look a bit like a scrapyard? 
Yes, we can touch. I hope I'm putting everyone off diving with this tiny. <laughs> so you can see this window here. Do you see this thing here? Brass window. There's the vent that would have been at the top. On the the vent would be on the inside. Or the outside. You got that wrong, I think. I think the vent would be with the grill on the outside. So there's the bath on the bottom here, and the shower and the rows of the shower, the sprinkler bit would be at the top. And then we get to the business now. It's all copper, copper and brass. But those sort of artifacts could easily get dragged off half a mile by a net, you know, very easily. And those are the sort of things that would look really good in a museum. But the underwater archaeological unit won't allow them, the owners, the new owners, lift any more brass until they have a place to put it. So it's a bit of a catch-22. And they want to build a big, you know, three and a half million or something uh, museum. So there are the whistles. You see the whistle that's the right hand of John there. There's another big one there, bigger. They're all three in different sizes. And there was a manifold down the bottom here. And there's a, a wrasse of some sort of fish. Here. So I'm going to move on to Britannic because, because the person who advertised this insisted we talk about the Britannic. And I'm limited in what I can say about the Britannic because we did an inside survey. It's the first time in the end of 2021 we were allowed to go inside. There were lots of people inside it before because we saw lots of lines, you know, divers' lines that trace to get back out. Anytime you go inside a wreck, no matter how careful you are, just a pin stroke and the water moving hits some rust. The rust is just waiting to sort of fall down, yeah? So you have to go in with the line and otherwise you, you never find your way out. And she was a hospital ship, uh, HMHS, the hospital, His Majesty Hospital Ship. Um, and it was going luckily to pick up survivors or people, survivors, wounded people from the Dardanelles, I presume it was, up in that area. And it passed by main, main Greece would be on your left, Key Island on your right, and she was going for channel in between the two. And there was only about a thousand people on board um, and the old story, launch the lifeboats, when you weren't told to launch the lifeboat, the captain was trying to make, hit a mine, he was trying to make for a beach or something to try and save the ship and, as best as possible. And people launched lifeboats and got chopped by the propellers. So there was only about 30 something, the low 30s died. And, uh, but there was only, there was about a thousand people, nurses and doctors and orderlies and chefs and all the rest. So luckily we were going to pick up the people. If that had been full of people who couldn't get out of the stretcher, couldn't swim, clearly the death toll would have been completely different. Um, this is a, a, a lovely photo of the conditions, looking up at the deco station, which we set up. Uh, I have set up every day, and we had a crew just to set up the deco station and the open circuit cylinders at various depths if we needed them, if our rebreathers failed and we had to come up. Um, it's about, it was about 24 degrees on decompression, 23 at the lowest, and it was 17 or 18 on the wreck. So you're at a 117 meters, 119 meters, and you've got 17 degrees of water like that. It doesn't even get that hot in Ireland. So it's just bliss. You know, you're still using dry suits and rebreathers, but it's bliss. And this is the crew. So we'd, we'd, we'd uh, cardiologists and um, uh, uh, doctors doing all sorts of tests on us, literally tests on iPad, speed tests, uh, tests where you had different color bubbles on the screen. And you have to remember two, two slides back. All sorts of mind tests before and after dives and all sorts of stuff. <clears throat> from uh, Dan, you see Dan the picture there in the middle. And it theoretically was the first time people were officially allowed inside the wreck. So we were looking at pictures of crockery and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, fascinating. She's quite hollowed out. She's very intact, uh, lying on her starboard side. Unbelievably intact. It's it's. It's incredible that something can be that intact. So clearly they're not in big storms like they do in the Atlantic in this area. And just to give you an idea, these are the more modern version of the rebreathers here, the one in the middle, say there. There's about seven rebreathers in that picture. They're actually hard to spot. But and there's all these tanks here. You wonder what are these tanks for? Well, these are open circuit tanks all rigged up to go on your side. So when you go deep, and a few of them would be for mounting on the way up as well. Um, so the first time anyone else can help you other than if you have a buddy, the first time anyone can help you is about 
a stage soon there's about 50 meters. That's sort of where your, where your help starts, even though you're at more than double that. It's pretty uncanny. I died this about 12 years before, two years ago, a year and a half ago. And and uh, it was uncanny. My first stop, I was up looking at the fly bridge on the bridge where they extend them out of it so they can look down the side of the ship. That was where my first stop was. I'm still looking at the wreck. It's, you know, it's over 30 meters off the bottom when she's on her side. She's at 80 degrees, so she's as good as on her side. Yeah. And there are scooters. So some people have these things with propeller at the back and they pull themselves along and they can go quite fast around the wreck. So if you do the whole wreck in one dive, all the way around. This is the dive center we use, Kia divers. Some people are relaxing at the back. They've got all their gear sorted. <laughs> That's when you got the word. When all your gear is sorted. So it'd be quite a small bubble, actually. And then two, I think there were eight or nine meter ribs as well. Uh, we always had to have something fast because the nearest chamber was back on the mainland. And there was an island in our way. We had to go one way or the other to get around Long Island. We had to go one way or the other to get, and Athens is a bit up the coast. It's not right at the tip of uh, mainland Greece. So there's a bit of a journey if, you're, if you get the bends. And nobody did. Great. These are the side mount rebreathers I was mentioning. So he's got a rebreather on his back, and he's got a whole, whole total redundancy on the side, you know, at least six hours or more on the side. And this was this was sponsored by the Explorers Club. So they paid $45,000 for this kit. And that money only covered the boat, which was the dive center, if you like, and our accommodation. Didn't cover flights or food or all the usual things. So $45,000 for less than two weeks. And only covered two things. So it's very expensive to do anything out there. It's about four or five grand a day to go out in this little boat overall, not per person. So, and you can see how close the ships are getting there. The ships are supposed to stay a mile away, but when you're underwater and you hear all this boom, 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 these huge big ships. And the other thing that happened once to us, uh, there was uh, explo um, what do you call it? Fishing using explosives, dynamite. dynamite fishing. That was going on probably 10, 20 miles away, I don't know where. And there was this enormous crack. It sounded like somebody's cylinder had opened up underwater. Everyone was looking above them, because everyone's looking below them and they don't see a massive skip of bubbles. So they know there's probably no problem below them. You know, we're all divers on the line, decompressing. And everyone would turn around to look at the guy. Is the guy behind me? Cylinder explode or some valve pop out of it or something. And it was quite the most dramatic thing I've ever heard or felt, or felt underwater. It was like standing beside an explosion, even though it was probably 10 miles away, killing fish. Too. Then they all come to the surface and just pick them up. So this is looking across the winch and the, the bows just to the right. And looking across, this is just still taking off the cold pole. Well, that's, yeah, we have a port anchor go around the corner, port anchor. The bell is still there off the mast. Everyone wondered where the bell was. It was found by another group who were there just before us. He literally went out along the mast, found whether you step out of the mast, you go up the middle of the mast, you step out, you're in a basket, what do you call the basket? Crow's oh, nest. Sure. You're in the crow's nest, and the bell will be just above your head. The bottom of the bell will be just ding, 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 yeah? And if you, if you go to that point, and you just lose some buoyancy and go down to sea bed, the bell is just sitting there in amongst all these big shells, like oyster shells. Yeah, it was covered in shells. So one guy who got there before me just cleaned it off a bit so I could pictures of it, which I don't have here. We're not allowed to show you there's the propellers. There's three propellers. So um, steam engines, triple expansion, I think they were on both sides. And then the, the pass out steam from that went into a turbine. So they had turbine technology, as did the Lusitania, the Laurentic, and all the other ships are all justicial, all designed the same. The justicial was on the stocks, actually, straight after um, the Titanic. So this is the bigger sister. So Britannic was Olympic was scrapped. It was the Olympic class. The Olympic was scrapped after, and the Titanic was about I think about four to six thousand tons. And then they made improvements. Even though this sunk at about a third of the time, despite the improvements, it was about forty-eight thousand tons, which still is nothing compared to Queen Mary, which was eighty. You know, so still a big ship. I can tell you to swim, even to swim from the seabed here. <coughs> And that's 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 a bit of the central propeller there. To swim from the seabed up to where you see the deck disappearing at the side of the vessel, it's quite a swim. It doesn't look at the I can tell you. You're swimming against the tide. And you've been swimming around on the seabed for a while looking for something. That's that guy again you saw earlier sitting on the boat. 
I'm happy. Camouflage things, very important. There's very little sea life in the Mediterranean. We, we came across very little sea life. This is my sea life here. This is a selfie, by the way. You always have to have a selfie in the presentation. <laughs> it's a little, I don't know why. But this is a selfie. This is a little trigger fish. You'll see them in Ireland, the same size. If you see a fish flock floating and you take it out of the sea and you leave it in the deck, often after a while, you'll see, if you lift it up after a while, you'll see um, one of these guys sort of paddling around in the pool with back of the boat. Did you ever see them in Ireland, no? Yeah, we've come across them. At, at deck level, we've come across them, not diving. Taking your sea on the water, you're seeing plates, potties. They wanted anything. Beds, all the beds were all crumbled. Like the beds, you could literally, the pipes, the, you know, the metal in the beds wouldn't have been great. Um, on the water, sea water, you could just crush them like that. So there's no beds of gurneys going to come up or wheelchairs going to come up out of this wreck ever because you literally couldn't. It would be a little piece of rust if you, if you tried to gather one up. Uh, but you will see poles and bed pans, and uh, they, they found the maker's plate on the engine. Uh, they went down a thing called Scotland Road. It's a, it's in the middle of it. It's, it's a passage or a wide passageway where all the workers would come and go for their work and food and all that. It's called Scotland Road. It's a bit of a strange name. And they went down. Everything's on its side. It's very confusing. No matter how much you train yourself to understand where you are in the wreck, it's very confusing. Because you, see, you keep seeing chlorophylls over there. On the side. You keep getting it wrong because you're floating always upright the right way. And you don't, if you could go along sideways, you'd make a good fist of the wreck. Because you'd know you'd have to go that way to go deeper. Whereas if you just winch the wreck in through, say, A or B deck and drop down, you end up looking at sand at the other side of the porthole. But you've gone deeper, you've gone 30 meters deeper in the wreck, but you haven't gone down a deck. Very, very confusing. I, I almost never got my head around it, I have to say. I have to rely on my body. So the Empress of Britain, the beautiful, this was really, this was sort of the, your first class only. I think it was, I can't remember now, it was a huge number of first class only. I think it was 176 or something, but there was only 40 or something second class. And I don't think they bother too much with third class. Third class don't, doesn't ex exist on these vessels. So these were cruising vessels, basically. And she's in the Panama Canal, as you can see there. Um, Pre-Second World War. <coughs> but clearly, she, this is by a guy called Gerard Dooley. He's in the um, University of Limerick, and they have built all of these. So there's quite a, quite a lot happening in Ireland, which you don't hear about. Uh, they've tried it out. As you can see there, the deep water, it, it didn't always do what they wanted it to do. They bring it occasionally to Porto a quarry and drop it in there with a crane to test it out. But they're sort of at the forefront of, of ROV, remotely operated vehicle technology. So it's a, a machine, it's very expensive, big, you throw it in the water and it, it goes off. And it's not unmanned, uh, it's unmanned, but it's not, it's still tethered to the surface. There are ones nowadays that they use that go off and do their own thing. You've heard of them. Finding endurance down in the, in the Antarctic. They literally go and you program it to go and do a, a mow the lawn and do a, a pattern. And they come across something and they have the software, the AI, it's called artificial intelligence to know it's a wreck or if it's a rock. So that's how they find a lot of these vessels nowadays. They tried to find NH370, was it that airplane? They spent a lot of money on those. And the thing went up and down the Indian Ocean, but never found it. Um, so we dived the bow, which is the bit down at the very bottom there. It was put together by a guy called Michael Barnett, an American guy. Not broadcastable is an in, an in joke. I was told my videos are so bad that they'll never be used for broadcast. <laughs> There's in fact, they have been used quite a bit, even though they're so <laughs> cool. You can probably guess where that is, can you? Up the road. We burnt for over, over two days, almost three days, I think. And she was full of gold. You'll hear this in the news. There's people still trying to pull gold out of this. This is one now you'll remember. Because it'll keep coming up in the news. So yeah, 75 miles offshore. It's quite a, it's quite a long way. 
So we're right at the edge of the continental shelf. If we went down another four or five miles, we'd be in a thousand meters. Another 10 miles could be in 2000 meters. And, and one side of the wreck is about eight, 10 meters deeper than the other side. So the slope has already happened you know, before, you, before it drops. We used to have to pull off the gunnel years ago before you put the door in the boat. Pretty horrible because you're being slapped quite a lot of slack. You could be badly slapped in the side. That's a bow lying on its port side. And you'll see net, or probably not see net, there's, there's monofilament net off to the off to the left there. So when you're diving at any depth, you, you're, you're keeping your eye out for things that are, you don't want to go over there, but I know, there's a rope over your head, you don't want to, you want to go over that, but you want to go under it. You know, if you go under it, there's something going to get snagged. So sort of, you have to look out for yourself. There's a net there, actually, on the left. That's the very extent. This was salvaged in 95, I think. So the telegraph is gone. There's a, there's a conger living where the telegraph used to be here. Conger's head sticking out there. It's the head of, they didn't take the stand, the brass stand. They should have taken that, it would have looked nice. And the salvors. There used to be a bell hanging here. The bell is gone. This is the derrick for lifting anchors. If you ever need to lift an anchor in, I put an, a spare anchor out. And the deck still has lots of wood on it. See the wood here? Anchor chain. Fair leads. So this structure here at the bottom is um, there are two crutches, and the crutches would hold the the, the cargo derrick. You know, the, the thing, the boom that stuck out to load stuff on off from the from the key. There's a porthole. It's, I think they're called deadlight portholes. They don't open. They're just a pane of glass and really thick. Anything up near the bow that's pounding against the weather, you don't open those portholes. So, and this is a big brass, big bronze gear for for the captains, which is through the deck. One thing we're seeing on all these deep wrecks now, and I've never noticed it before, are Fish called blue mounts. Did you ever hear of blue mounts? They're, I think they're a type of scorpion, scorpion fish. You'll see, them, you'll see them here. See that fellow there? You'll see them floating around here. It's a little there on the left. I don't ever remember seeing these, but we're seeing them all. We've got, we did, we dived the Assyrian once in 142, and it was carpeted with these fish. I think they're catching a lot on the west coast now. Bright orange and milk and use it. I just had never seen it before. I think there were a reason to ride it. Barry was trying to take a picture of me there. The trouble with housings nowadays, uh, certainly those days, he should have turned his camera on before he got to 100 meters. He was raised to 100 meters. Um, and when he got down, all the buttons were stuck and all jammed. So anything you have to press, you press in and it stays in. So generally, up with any DSLR, if you press the button in and hold it in, it upsets the functionality of a load of other things that you want to do. So this is the paint in the anchor pocket. The original paint is still in the anchor pocket, which is quite impressive. And this is the shot line, which, by the way, we it broke. Shot line is right at the stem. And we lost about five or 600 euros worth of strobes, these flashing lights we use, because uh, every diver clips on a strobe. That's going back in, I know, I need to show you. There's one of the strokes there. Not working. It should be flashing by now. You can see some of these things flashing. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to finish off. If you want to look at any videos that I've done, you can, you can look at Vimeo, or just Google Vimeo, Stewie, and Andrews. Vimeo is like YouTube. It's like slightly better quality than YouTube. So if you put those three words into Google, you'll probably come across and just look at them all. This was shot. Most of my diving is shallow. It's a 10 liter open circuit cylinder. Most of my diving is with a diving club, dog and scuba divers. So I've already done quite a few dives this year because we've been training trainees. We did eight dives one weekend with all our trainees. And we dived the previous weekend. And we're diving this weekend in the key.
So if we're on the nine o'clock news, we've done something wrong. I did to the city. We're on the nine o'clock news. And Barry is my buddy. He's the one who has an enormous amount of pictures and video as well. It's a huge amount. I can only think of one word that comes to mind that's absolutely stupendous. Stupendous <laughs> lecture of killer. Uh, I'm absolutely in awe of your achievements in these times, but I'm not altogether sure that I'm all that envious. But I'm sure there might be a few questions. I, so, uh, dive to the depth of 120 meters. How long did that take you from getting off the Gordon Bethel? So, so in any dive, you tend to go down at about 20 meters a minute. And if it's no decompression, you don't come up faster than 10 meters a minute. So any dive, you'll find it works out always roughly 18, 20 meters a minute on the way down. If it's really, really deep, you one of the four of us didn't have a scooter. So I let him, I wasn't in charge overall, but I was in charge of the logistics of the dive, which is sort of a bit of a funny chain of responsibility. So I told everyone to get in the water and hang around at six meters. One guy, had, he was just kicking with his fins down 160 meters. So I gave him a four, almost a four and a half minute head start. So that when we were coming down with scooters, we actually, he hit the deck just as the first guy on the scooter was hitting the deck. So the time we worked out well. We wanted to make sure that we all came up together. The most important thing, the most dangerous part of the dive is the very end of it. Because you've absorbed your most gases. Yeah. If you went down and did probably came up after a minute, you still have decompression to do, but a tiny amount. Whereas if you go down and you spend 10 minutes at any depths, you know, even 50 meters, you, you then have decompression to do. So the most dangerous part is when you start to go home. It's a bit like Everest. The most dangerous, the most difficult bit is getting home safely. It's not actually going down there. I can strap something on your back and bring you down. No problem at all. Just do what I said. It's it's going home carefully. That's a big problem. Um, it's like uh, going inside these wrecks, a fairly dangerous exercise because the bits of rusting metal must tend to drop off. Well, right. it's 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 uh, zero vis on the way back out. No matter how careful you are, you have no visibility on the way back out. Because on the Britannic, I went into the hospital. They asked me to go into the hospital end of it, which is at the very stern. And uh, I went in, I actually went through the walls. There were holes in the walls about the size of a sort of kitchen table. And I was able to go through the holes. I didn't even bother going down to the corridor and in each door. I went literally until I couldn't go any further, till I could only put a camera through the last, the last section. So there would have been doctor's rooms, waiting rooms, you know, whatever. And... Uh, yeah, when you turn around, having put burst your way through walls and things, it, it's zero is You're totally reliant on not losing the real. Yeah, it's zero is absolutely zero. Even though you're not, the worst case is usually when you're making bubbles, because the bubbles go up, they hit the, whatever it is, wall, ceiling, depending on the wreck, and then it all comes down. Same in, it's same in some caves, depending on the cave, how uh, much flow there is, the same thing again. I mean, you only have to do the Murrays and O'Leary Harbour. You, 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 you observe everything in the harbour. You do all the stuff higher up from the boat down. But the moment you pull one link out of the seabed, it's a black mud. It's there for thousands of years. And you touch it, and it just, it just comes up all around you. And you are literally, from then on, it's, it's touch. You're t checking the links or whatever. And that's O'Leary Harbour. It's no different to that. I mean, uh, I dived on a, a great big car carrier off Larnica in Cyprus, fairly modern thing, it was laying on its side. And all of the interior partitions and bulkheads, walls and what have you, are made of MDF originally. And if that swelled up to about five times its normal size, and if you touch out that, it just fell into porridge. And so much so that it, it's, it's Absolutely suicidal to go inside. Zenobia, is it? Yeah, there's Zenobia. You have something like seven people have died on it. It's, it's never, not I've that long heard. down. Never it's done. a tremendous dive all the way. Make visibility on the outside. You dare to go inside because I think in a very short space of time, seven people died on it. Oh. Are there any more questions? The munitions that were on there, are they still lethal? Yes. Yeah. We died yeah, generally it's cordite, so it's, it's quite safe. It's like spaghetti, fat spaghetti, so it's quite safe. Uh, mind you, if you like cordite, 
you can stick it into water and it'll stay burning. But underwater, it's not going to start burning. Um, there would be TNT heads in some of the shells, but again, it's not always wet, but can be wet. The German stuff was amazing. The German stuff is incredible with the build stuff. Um, the Germans, the Germans' mentality was: we will win the war and we carry on with the whatever it is. Could be a it could be a shell or a bullet or whatever or a vessel. The German mentality was looking way beyond the war, whereas the Americans and the British were building ships to be sunk. You know, it, it was totally different, totally different uh, way of viewing life. The, uh, the only time I've seen a skeleton was in Truck Lagoon, which is in the Pacific. I've seen a head jam between two metal plates uh, and there are bones. In general, it doesn't last, you know, it's calcium, it doesn't last long. The In the Curso, which I didn't talk about, which the Queen Mary sliced in two, the, one of the most poignant things having, we see, we see soles of German German boots. We look down into a hole in the U-boat, you'll see the sole. The sole is really thick and rubber, strong rubber, and would last through the 100 years time, some of those soles. But I suppose one of them, I and mean, we never got it on film, and I encouraged the guy to go back on one of the dives, and he wouldn't, when we were filming for one of the production companies. But there were two boots in, in, in under the vessel. So this is an area, it's like a little triangle that once the ship sinks, if the person was under it, they'd be trapped. And clearly, there's very little movement there. You know, and any nets going past or anything like that wouldn't catch way in under that, that little triangle. And there were two boots lying, like literally if you lay down, and the two boots were lying one on top of the other like that. So clearly the person had, you know, dissolved out of the boots and boots were not Because there's no way two boots falling, falling half, say the ship was halfway down, they fell out of the ship, but the guy was struggling and picked his boots off. There's no way they would have landed exactly the way they were in the process. Um, you alluded to about the Britannic. Was it a condition? You were given permission to go down, but not to fill them inside the Sartes, or On this occasion, it was the first time officially ever that the Greek effort gave permission to fill them inside it, not touch anything. So, uh, so yeah, we, we were allowed inside it. Other people had been in there. There were lines in there where other people had followed. Okay, yeah. We have a good idea what other trips had been there and who had been inside. But this was the first one they ever officially sank. They've stopped trips before that some of these people I was with were on. They've stopped trips if they heard somebody went inside. Okay. There's a very good documentary made by Cousteau and his colleagues about dive on the Britannic. Yeah. I think they were some of the first to do it. And I think they actually demonstrated Right. Yeah. It's very well worth watching. It is, yeah. yeah. It's on YouTube, isn't it? It is, yeah. 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 When, when the photographs are from the British, when did you come out? I don't know. Because, because Discovery paid so much via the Explorers Club in New York, because they paid so much money, they have a contractual rights for something like up to five years. So if I pop up and say, I'm going to do a documentary, this is all in the contract. You can't, we weren't allowed to do anything for 12 months, and then the rest of I think it was five years. I signed a contract, but to be honest with you, I can't remember. Basically, if you say, I'm going to make a documentary on that, they still have dibs over the footage, and they'll sit down at a meeting and decide, will we make the, the documentary that Stuart wants to make, or will we just let them go ahead? So they still have rights for quite a bit into the future on that footage. So we, we don't show anything. In fact, if anyone hadn't showed anything, then or in any time, at any time, even today, without permission. Uh, to be honest with you, if they put something on social media or something, that's the last time you get an invite. It was that serious. Well, uh, just remind me to say a very, very sincere thanks on behalf of everybody here, on behalf of the Dublin Bay All Gaffers Association and our Zoom viewers also, and to say thank you very much indeed. Just a very small, very, very small oh. token presentation to make to you, Stewie. There you go. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.